Good afternoon. It is April 15th, tax day, so reminder for anybody who hasn't filed yet. Uh, we're here as the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee. I'm here with my colleagues, Councilmember Juando, Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. Uh, we're here to take up some operating budget and uh, some continuation of capital budget items, starting with Housing Opportunities Commission. I see we have Ms. Andrews and some of the staff from Housing Opportunities Commission and uh, council staff as well. I'm gonna turn it over to council staff and then uh, we can turn it over to Housing Opportunities uh, Commission and, 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 and Ms. Andrews. We just wanna start by thanking you for all of the great work that you have been doing. This has been an important and critical partnership as we have addressed the housing crisis, we have a lot more work to do. There have been recent advancements at the state level, which we're excited about and look forward to continuing. I know Housing Opportunities Commission has been busy uh, appearing at the White House uh, to talk to uh, the, uh, the, the president and his team uh, about how the federal government uh, can help to leverage some of the things that we're doing here in Montgomery County and how that could be replicated in jurisdictions across the country, including our very successful housing production fund. We're taking efforts now with the nonprofit preservation fund, which I'm really appreciative of my colleagues on this committee in particular and, and uh, broader colleagues of moving forward with the $20 million first tranche of funding that we look forward to, to reaching $50 million uh, soon enough. Uh, he's not here, uh, but I uh, want to give a shout out to Zach Marks as well for all of his uh, work and uh, just want to you know, thank you for uh, you know, really being at the forefront of the public-private partnership. Uh, really, that has been the, the secret sauce that has made a lot of these programs work, working with nonprofit partners, working with for-profit partners, bringing people together to address uh, these issues and working collaboratively. I think importantly uh, with the council and the executive branch and our external uh, partners as well. And just from a District 1 perspective, lots of great projects like uh, the Lindley, which has won uh, several awards and has been recognized and has three bedrooms, which I know is of, of uh, significant uh, interest and importance to colleagues, including Councilmember Juwanda, who has been a leader on that uh, issue, ma making sure that we have family supporting units. Uh, but also wanted in particular thank you for the recent work uh, at my request uh, uh, in the Tobytown community. Uh, there was a recent resource fair there, which I thought was really helpful and really important. Uh, but uh, HOC and, and DHCA working uh, together with, with our office uh, to make sure that we're uh, addressing those uh, issues is, is really important. So big things are happening in Montgomery County. We're doing a lot of uh, great work. Uh, HOC has been a big part of those initiatives that we've undertaken. Just want to express my appreciation for that. So happy to turn to colleagues. If there are any comments, if not, I'll turn it over uh, to Mr. Enbinder and uh, for any uh, uh, initial comments and to walk us through the packet and to turn it to Ms. Andrews and HOC at the appropriate time. Good afternoon, Chair Friedson, Council Members. Uh, the County Executive recommends for the Housing Opportunities Commission Non-Departmental Account, or HOC-NDA, a total of $8,295,315, which uh, is an increase of $322,814, or a 4.0% increase from the FY24 approved amount. The entirety of this increase comprises incremental FY25 compensation, health and retirement benefits, that do not constitute new or expanded programs. Um, so a couple of just brief informational items for the committee, but I'll say at, up top, uh, council staff does recommend approval um, of this executive's recommendation uh, for the HOC NDA for FY25. Um, and just briefly, uh, some of the items on page two of your packet. Um, as an external agency, as the committee is aware, uh, HOC is not required to complete the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice's operating budget equity tool, but equity does remain a key guiding principle of HOC's mission. Uh, it's been explicitly incorporated into uh, their new five-year strategic plan. Uh, and as the committee is aware, uh, there's been a lot of interest in uh, affordable housing, preservation, development, construction of affordable housing, including at the five um, uh, public hearings that the council held last week. Uh, so again, uh, council staff does recommend approval as recommended by the executive and happy to turn it over to HOC for additional comments. 
Great. Ms. Andrews, welcome. Yes, thank you so much, and thank you to you all and the full committee, as well as the council, for your constant support of HOC. And yes, we are on a national platform because of the program and the different um, funding sources that we've been able to stand up in this county. So I want to also just echo uh, uh, appreciation on behalf of our board, but also on behalf of our residents and my team, um, because it really does mean a lot to have the vote of confidence from the council so that we can continue to advance our mission. Um, and of course, we want to continue to thank you all for the support that you provide. This particular budget touches our residents, which is the reason why we do what we do. It is not just building the houses that we build. It is the residents that we serve. This particular funding source is truly the major source that we use to fund our resident services programs. Federal government does not provide funding for resident services because of our current structure, um, because we don't have public housing, we have RAD. So many of the funding um, streams that would be available to us in terms of resident services on the federal side are not. And so this critical source from the county is imperative. And we thank you all for your continued support. I will also note that our um, uh, portfolio, as you know, continues to grow. And we're growing at the, the pace that you allow us to. But that means we have more residents that we want to serve. And while we have received funding to support our current staffing structure, I want to plant a seed for the future because I intend to come back and request additional support because we need to be able to provide resident ser services across our full portfolio. And that, that includes needing additional support and staff to do that. Um, and then just last but certainly not at least want to just highlight that we also provide resources to individuals on our waiting list. It's something we pride ourselves in. We provide financial um, literacy. Um, our, we have multiple programs in terms of outreach, education, etc. that can be located on our website at www.hocmc.org, um, but that also provides resources to individuals as they wait for this critical um, need. And so this Funding supports that work. And as you know, we have over 35,000 individuals on our waiting list. So our hope is that we are able to address our waiting list, not only by building additional homes, but also reducing the number of people on our waiting list because of the services we've been able to provide to those individuals while they have been on the list or while they're waiting on the list. So again, want to thank you for your constant support and um, uh, continued um, appreciation appreciation for all that you do to support HLC. Well, thank you so much. And uh, since you uh, mentioned vouchers, as we've noted at this committee and colleagues are, are well aware, it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, unlike many other jurisdictions, we continue to take people on the wait list mm -hmm. uh, for those vouchers. Uh, the good news is that allows them to access services and for us to know who they are, because we know that there are real needs there. The challenge is we don't take people off the wait list necessarily at uh, you know the rate at which they may no longer need uh, services and the list is really long uh, in other places the wait list is finite and once you no longer are eligible on the wait list it stops and so it doesn't reflect the full need uh, and so uh, it looks like our wait list is dramatically different than other places when we know that vouchers are in short supply everywhere it's why many in congress are trying to get a lot more funding and support for vouchers unfortunately those initiatives have uh, fallen short but did just want to note yes. that i think there are things that we can do to change and improve that i know you have been working towards that this committee has you know taken up that issue we'll continue uh, to look into that issue but i just want to make sure that we acknowledge that because it always comes up of why our wait list is exponentially longer than some of the other jurisdictions and uh, it's like reporting in some cases. Yes. Um, you know, sometimes the incidents are no different, but the reporting uh, is different. In this case, our wait list is longer, but it doesn't mean the needs yes. uh, necessarily in our community are, are that much different uh, than in similar uh, jurisdictions. With that, let me turn to Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez. Just a quick question. Uh, Ms. Andrews, you mentioned that you are planning to come back in the future for additional mm -hmm. funds. Um, if you can, if you don't have to answer 
that right now, but it would be great if you can send us uh, an email at some point as we are discussing the budget. I wonder, I wonder if the, the needs that you're referring to mm -hmm. um, are covered by things that are already putting investments in the county in terms of, I don't know, whatever it is that you're thinking of, mm -hmm. access to healthcare resources or youth activities or like I, give me an idea because as we discussed, I would like to understand uh, more and I wonder if there are partnerships that you're already working on with county agencies um, that perhaps can alleviate some of the issues that you're referring to. And also, if you have an idea of when you're planning to come back requesting that. Right. And so our, our thinking was to plant the seed now for next oh, year's planting budget the seed, cycle. For sure. cycle. Yes. <laughs> for next for next year's planning oh. cycle, budget cycle. But if there's an opportunity um, to explore how we might leverage some resources sooner than that, definitely would like to. I'll turn it over to Ken Silverman, our Vice President of Government Affairs, to share more insight. Just wanted to share, as um, Mr. Ambinder mentioned, uh, we recently got approval for our new five-year strategic plan. We're finalizing the document uh, now, so you know, watch your inboxes for, for that to come, and we really look forward to uh, sharing that with you and, and getting your feedback. And uh, as part of that, we have a number of objectives around uh, expanding our, our resident services uh, that we provide within HOC, as well as the partnerships that we have with uh, county partners and, and other agencies and, and nonprofits in the county um, to provide those services. Like as, as after school activities for residents, that type of thing. Absolutely. Yes. And the more uh, details that you can provide, because maybe we can match with things already happening. I see the rec department in the back. Um, so anyway, I, I'm glad that you're bringing this up, you know. Um, but the more details you can provide, the better. Will the do. sooner the better. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Juan. Thank you, yes. And uh, we've talked about this over the years, and I know this is an area where there is a need for more funding, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I appreciate you recognizing the budget we're yeah. dealing with. Um, and, uh, but. I appreciate Councilman Fanny Gonzalez's point. Yeah, the, the the details would be good so that we can just start thinking about, as I know you will, a plan to to support uh, heading into next year. Uh, I guess this this could be a question for Ken, but whoever you know, whoever's best positioned. Uh, you mentioned you know you're not eligible for resident services funding at the federal level because of the type of mm -hmm. structure we have. Mm -hmm. Is that a legislative? problem or a regulatory problem? It is a legislative and regulatory problem. Okay. Um, and it's something that I've actually also raised, and not local, federal. Yeah, right. Uh, That's right. what I'm asking. Uh, right. Something that we've raised with HUD even most recently in an opportunity to speak about how HUD can think about how agencies are transforming. So as housing authorities has have transformed out of the old platform of public housing agencies where they had public housing funds and it you know not to get too technical but the contract with HUD included some funding sources and various grant opportunities right. for public housing authorities many housing authorities have converted their portfolios similar to how we have been able to transform our portfolio when we have mixed income models we're not having a funding source from HUD for those various developments and we're not eligible for various resident services grants that are currently available to housing authorities that have the typical public housing model. And so we've advanced uh, this discussion and advocated for HUD to think more broadly on this issue and even think about changing some of the criteria um, for some of their funding sources, knowing that at the same time they are encouraging housing authorities to transition into other, tr um, other models for their housing and for their development. Um, and so it's an archaic approach. You know, in the past you had your standard concentrated public housing model that might have even had a resident services office right on site. 
um, and they provided some form of funding that you could use to leverage for those employees and those resources. And as we've evolved, the funding sources have not evolved along with that. And we have just been very fortunate to have the support of the council, which has allowed us to fund our resident services. And just to be clear, it's not just programming. It's everything from assisting our residents with completing their applications, staying in um, compliance with our program, um, knowing the kids and the children and making sure that they're in different programs, um, ensuring that our residents have access to employment opportunities, also connecting them with resources. So there's case management support right. that happens as well. Um, so it's a full spectrum of resources that um, our team provides to our residents. I appreciate that. I, I think so. What, I'd love to know specifically because, look, we're just you're just at the White House and South Court Auditorium being honored for the innovative approach that we're doing here mm -hmm. that we funded and you all have implemented around the revolving fund and all that stuff. Um, I, I would love to know, and you could come back, if sometimes, as you know, HUD may, may already have the authority to, under certain grant programs, they could, you know, for example, a lot of times it's, what's the definition of a public house? Like, how are you defining it? Is, is it, are they, do they have the flexibility? And I've, there's other areas where this administration in particular has taken old laws and changed the way they interpret them regulatory from on the, on the regulatory side to expand eligibility for certain things. And I'm thinking, for example, there were a set of us that advocated for uh, different types of funding for mental health supports for people who are interacting with law enforcement, for example, and you, you were able to take some traditionally grants that were seen just to be funding law enforcement to actually fund MCOT teams and other things that mm -hmm. had people outside of law enforcement. So I would just, it might be worth, maybe you've already done this, but since we're being highlighted, you know, it might be, and you have advocated already, mm -hmm. you know, and I'd be happy to work with you offline on this, just really get the full list of programs that provide any support of resident services and is there any flexibility that wouldn't require because legislative change is really hard right but if there's anything that could maybe be seen as from the regulatory side I imagine there has to, there might be something because it'd be worth it you know you know yes. so if, Ken well just the two two comments one is I do want to emphasize there are federal resident resident services programs that we do you know anything we can access we do right. uh, and so for example the family self-sufficiency program right. which serves uh, voucher holders right. uh, we definitely utilize that program I think you know as fully as we as we can uh, we also have a, a fatherhood initiative program which mm -hmm. is a federal grant that we've applied for and uh, retained for several years um, so we're definitely looking to do those but there are these specific funding streams that are generally allocated for public housing, um, you know, that are not available outside of that context. And I, you know, Ms. Andrews has absolutely, you know, in, in the White House and, and in these other rooms, uh, raised that point over and over. Um, they have shown a willingness to listen. Um, so I definitely would love to work, work with you and, and anyone else to disentangle exactly you yeah, know, let's, what could be done through the administration versus Congress. Some, that takes a little work sometimes to follow yep. up, and then you can build these coalitions of people across the country that are trying to do this, because like you said, we're not the only one structured this way. Right. So let's just do some intentional work on that. It might be, I think the juice, juice could be potentially worth the squeeze. So, yes. but, but really happy with everything you're doing and, and appreciate the work. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll just note, I was included in the packet, but I just think it's important to note this the operating budget NDA that we're talking about here is about eight million dollars mm -hmm. the total budget operating budget for the Housing Opportunities Commission is about 350 million dollars so it's just important to note uh, all the different revenue streams and all the different places where Housing Opportunity Commission gets its funding uh, a lot of it is federal, uh, some of it is state, some of it is from existing investments, and, uh, and some of it is from renters, even though they're subsidized rents, that's a key income stream uh, as well, uh, about a third of the budget, uh, actually. Uh, almost half of it comes from federal sources. So um, just, I think the context here matters. We, you know, eight, eight million dollars, a little over eight million dollars is a lot of money, uh, but it pales in comparison to the total cost of running the county's public housing agency. So 
Uh, with that, um, without objection, we're going to uh, recommend this uh, to the full council. And uh, again, appreciation for all of your hard work and your continued partnership. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Okay, we're going to switch gears and move on to our friends in the Department of Recreation. I see Director Riley and colleagues are here, and I see Ms. Yao is making her way up, has already made her way up to the table. I can't look down. You move quickly, Vivian. Uh, appreciate it. Um, let me turn it over uh, to you to walk us through the packet, um, and um, we can turn it over to the Department of Recreation at the appropriate time if they want to share any high-level comments. Okay, great. Um, good afternoon. For fiscal year 25, the executive is recommended re recommending total expenditures of $64,759,678 for the Department of Recreation. It's approximately an increase of $5 million or 8.5% from the fiscal year 24 approved budget. There is an increase of 9.77 FTEs and one position. The table on page, the top of page two of your packet shows the recommended uh, budget as well as the fiscal year 23 and 24 approved budget amounts. Um, we're going to, council staff has structured the staff report according to the council president's uh, bud recommended budget approach. And so we'll be going over things um, in that way. Um, as far as racial equity and social justice, the department received a total score of eight out of 10. And the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice found that the department demonstrates a strong commitment to advancing racial equity and social justice in Montgomery County, that its core team plays an active role in adv advancing RESJ both internally, staff are trained, reflective of the populations they serve and actively engaged, and externally. Clients benefit from the department's understanding of systemic issues affecting their communities. Um, for the program score of recreation, community, and neighborhood centers, the department received a four out of four. And uh, the pr program demonstrated a strong likelihood to reduce and or eliminate racial disparities and other inequities in the county, um, and a clear correlation between racial and inequities and the program's need was established. Um, so those were uh, what the, those were their RESJ um, findings. Um, also, as far as testimony goes, the department received actually quite a bit of testimony from residents fully supporting the department's budget, uh, including adaptive recreation, increasing full-time career staff at recreation facilities in lieu of seasonal staff, senior programming enhancements, improving maintenance and accessibility, and replacing equipment at recreation facilities. So moving on to operating budget expenditure issues, um, the table on page four of your packet shows items that council staff has identified as required changes for the, re for the department. And as such, council staff recommends that the PHP committee recommend approval of these items, um, and they would not go on the new and enhanced program list. Without objection, thank you. And just to reflect, this is our first time really going through this you know, particular exercise. The idea is last year we included any increase in the budget uh, on a list, and then we had new programs alongside contractual obligations, inflationary increases to costs that we can't change and that we can't control. And so uh, we're now separating those out in terms of new programs and new initiatives, new personnel versus increases in costs of ongoing uh, expenditures and legally required contractual obligations. So thank you for that. Without objection, we'll approve that. The table at the bottom of page four of your packet includes recommended budget, operating budget enhancements. And so um, there are a number of 
uh, items that we will be walking through as we go through um, uh, the various items. Uh, council staff does note that the items related to out of school time programming will be considered uh, with the joint uh, PHP and ENC committee later on. I think it's the meeting will be on May 1st of this year. Um, so uh, council staff was asked to do like a mini budget review or mini um, base budget review and so um, PLAR was the topic that we we're doing this more in depth budget review. Um, so PLAR is planned life cycle asset replacement and the department has uh, in its budget um, a, a budget for PLR for fiscal year 25 the amount is 1.23 million um, we had originally gotten information that said it was 957,000 but that was subsequent subsequently updated and that amount is an increase of $70,312 um, to the fiscal year 24 amount there is also a $2,120 increase in costs for servicing the White Oak turf field. Um, for the last several years before fiscal year 25, the PLR fund had remained stagnant at 955000 And council staff wanted to note that this amount um, is still lower than the PLR funding that was in place in fiscal year 08. Um, because of uh, budget recession and tight budgets, PLR has been kind of a target for taking savings because, you know, there aren't necessarily uh, staff associated with these funds. But as a result, um, you know, when you, when you take away these maintenance funds, you know, it has an impact on uh, a whole list of things in terms of, you know, what the department can um, upkeep and all sorts of other things. So um, use of the PLR, of PLR is the budgets are for 22 and 23 are included on page 6 of your packet. And the current budget covers primarily basic maintenance cost of repairs and emergency response. It does not allocate funds for impacts of gradual deterioration or environmental changes. Funds are not budgeted for plan replacement, um, the maintenance and replacement of new assets coming online, or the increase in aging infrastructure. And this lack of planning, planning and budgeting um, risks unexpected and costly failures and results in the need for rushed and unplanned capital expenditures. So a lot of times, you know, uh, these funds have been used to address things that, are, you know, are emergencies coming online instead of necessarily um, addressing regular things that need to be replaced, et cetera. So the department maintains a list, a, a limited data on the PLR program Priority lists are collected from each facility and resource allocation is made on available operational impact once all required maintenance is accounted for. Um, the department is planning on coll collaborating with DGS to use a new asset management software to track useful life, use metrics such as replacement value, and make recommendations for life cycle based budgeting. And so uh, Council staff did not hear about like how long this effort would take and when it would be in place, and so that might be something later on that the committee may be interested in exploring. But on top of page seven is a list of items that are defer deferred because of lack of funding in fiscal year. So it's a whole list of things, painting and wall repair, keeping appliances updated, locker replacement, repatting of divider walls, et cetera. So again, because of limited the limited budget of PLAR, there's various things that, um, that the department isn't able to get to um, on a consistent basis. Um, so council staff 
uh, notes that PUR has been underfunded uh, for many years. Again, it's below the fiscal year 08 level, and many more facilities have come online since then. So they have less a lesser budget to take, of, take care of more things. Um, the lack of adequate funding to maintain or replace equipment has resulted in con consumer complaints and concerns regarding the appearance and fu function of recreation services and facilities. And the council actually received testimony from several constituents requesting improved facility maintenance, replacing equipment, and upgrades to recreation facilities. Um, the department also noted that aging infrastructure that is improperly equipped to support high impact use and meet changing needs restricts the department's ability to maintain a level of services that advances racial equity and social justice. So um, council staff recommends adding approximately 49,000 to the new and enhanced program list. And that amount of funding would bring the PLAR budget up to the fiscal year 08 level. Um, and, you know, again, recommends that the, the committee keep track of this with a plan to raise PLAR levels to, you know, an adequate level. Um, the executive did note that the new Recreation Facilities Asset Replacement CIP project would actually address replacement of various assets. Um, but council staff does note that that funding in that project is not recommended <clears throat> to begin until fiscal year 29. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for doing that deep dive. Thank you for your work and for presenting this. I'll note 2008, there's been a little bit of inflation since then. Uh, so that number doesn't even reflect inflation. Uh, and uh, we'll also know we have more facilities and bigger facilities. You know, we've done expansions, we've added new facilities, presumably and hopefully the new facilities have fewer maintenance needs than the older facilities, but those older facilities aren't getting newer as the new facilities have been uh, built. So I appreciate the uh, recommendation. Just wanted to turn it over to Director Riley to make any comments here. I assume uh, you could speak quite a lot about the maintenance needs in your uh, facilities and how much use they get and how popular they are. I'll just note, uh, first of all, I was at Potomac Community Center, my home you know, rec center when I grew up that I spent most of my childhood at. Many of my first uh, were, were there, you know, first Little League game, first basketball, you know, games, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. First dance uh, in that uh, multi-purpose room at Club Friday. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's important at every level of the life cycle, our youngest and our oldest and everybody uh, in, in between. I was just there meeting with uh, one of our older adult groups that meets there regularly every Friday morning who were, you know, mentioning this. So it is true at every older facility uh, that there are needs that just aren't able to be honored. Uh, not that they aren't needs, but, um, you know, they have to be prioritize. So with that, let me turn it over to Director Riley and then I'll turn it to colleagues. Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you for your support. Um, I'm probably sitting in the same community lounge furniture you did as a young person as well. That's a fact. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we are we're fortunate. We see an increased use of our facilities. Um, it's a good thing. Our seniors are, are flocking to the buildings now, which is amazing to see. We, we are um, seeing an increased use around the clock, you know, from the morning in the seniors to after school. Um, and our infrastructure is aging. Um, we, you know, a small thing like a white coat, which is the spray that goes on a pool, can cost over $100,000. And that comes out of PLAR. And that needs to be done every eight years or so. And so when you have 11 pools, um, it can be expensive to try to do that. Um, you know, our, our free in 23 has been fantastic. We're seeing our, our fitness rooms full of people staying healthy, making Montgomery County one of the healthiest counties. Um, but our treadmills and our recumbent bikes and, and some of the leg presses are showing the wear. They are original to some of the buildings, quite honestly. And it's, a, as Vivian identified, sort of a 
break and repair, not a replace all at one time. And, you know, in FY29, that's one of our hopes to be able to do that, go into fitness rooms and just put all everything in new, as well as our kitchens, um, which are a revenue stream for us. When you rent a facility like East County Rec Center, you know, you're looking at the, I think that one's hot pink, laminate cabinets from the original building in, you know, in the 1980s, and Bower Drive has lime green and yellow. So those are opportunities that we would like to be able to come in and really put a new look on it um, and help, you know, not, oh, rain. Um, also, um, increase our, yeah um, access for our community to use for rentals and, and those types of things. Um, you know, we have several of our um, rec centers, like Longwood Rec Center, for example. The divider door's been shut for almost 10 years. We couldn't replace it. We didn't have the funding, so we just boarded it over. So the social hall at Longwood's not able to be divided, and some of our other ones are very very old and peeling and we take off the, the laminate and paint them sometimes so you know as could, as could you just will, share how would you prioritize like if you if you receive the fifty thousand dollars let's talk about how, how would that funding be fifty thousand utilized fifty thousand is not a whole lot i was going to say I could, besides <laughs> um, half of a pool yeah uh, i mean I, I think for us we would probably focus on a lot of our, our fitness room equipment mm -hmm. um it is it is showing its its wear and tear so that's why i think where we would start um fifty thousand is not going to get us a new kitchen at east right. county it's just not so i think that I would, we'd go back to our, our willie our our property manager and, and work with him and dgs and really help to identify the greatest need but i would say that in my two cents that would be where we would start you know adrian if yeah, well, i would love for you to come back and give sure. us uh, some list. more information on that i think yeah. it would yep. strengthen the case uh to to us and to colleagues to really understand what this uh, would would mean you know speaking for myself, but I think I'm getting nods from from colleagues here. Yeah. Um, and I'll just say you know, PLR to council staff's point, not just in recreation but in general, has started to be used as the reactive emergency response program for maintenance issues. But it was intended to be the proactive, avoiding the emergency from happening program for county facilities. And you know, it would save us a lot of money in the long term to get back to that type of change where we are proactively making improvements and, and, and doing the types of things that you're doing. Unfortunately, it's not happening tomorrow. It's happening in fiscal year 29. But you know, moving more in that direction of the proactive life cycle replacement where things are being moved out of service and new items are being moved into service where infrastructure is being updated where a modest investment could give an extra decade of productive use out of a room or a facility to you know serve the community that is using it and relying on it more and more so i i, sure. yep. I, I Andrew, appreciate I, it i agree with you it's not planned it's not yeah it's it's the unplanned <laughs> yeah, life cycle yeah. uh 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 burden uh, replacement or something yeah. uh, but it's 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 become the response uh, in many yeah. ways to some of the issues that your staff on the mm -hmm. front lines are, are dealing yeah. with and calling in you know uh, you know this room is out of use because of this issue we need to come in and, and fix it and working with DGS having to address those issues yeah. with that let me turn it to Councilor Drawn up I think I saw Ms. Clutter trying to jump. If you have anything, oh, you to, no, that's okay. Could you yeah, thank, yeah. thank you. I was I wasn't sure whether I was going to add or not. But one of the things that we are doing on a on a on a high level is we're working with County Stat to create like on our operations side. We have we had something called a strategic program index, which looks at a number of variables when we decide how how to allocate our resources. But on a CIP level, we we decided that we were going to create a plan similar to look at our buildings to consider things like. Um, the remaining years in the life cycle, um, equity factors, um, vulnerable populations, a percentage of youth, percentage of seniors, um, you know, demographic characteristics. Um, we started doing some of that mapping already, and then also looking at um, the amount of use that our facilities are getting. So we could strategically decide um, what buildings should be in, you know, in priority order 
but you know when uh, when we get a little limited amount of funding we'll certainly look at where our greatest needs are look at the, that plan as well but then make the de determination what, what buildings getting used more which equipment's getting the most use, use and which is just completely so outdated that we got to start there so we are um, uh, working and we have some plans that are, are uh, underway right now and we'll be happy to share those with you as we go along they got a little bit more work to go into it but we're we're pretty proud about that yeah, I just want to add, we were very fortunate to get some state money this year to replace a lot of our um, really, really old, bad playgrounds. And so we're going to start that work this summer also. They were high, high needs to replace them as well. Awesome. Yeah, and I, it's a good point. Funding coming from multiple areas. So would, would Pilar address a really old indoor ceiling and vent, like that's, the dust is everywhere? That's not addressing that, right? Where's that, that coming that from? Is that is not. CIP? That is, unless that's Dave DGS. That's a DGS. Like an HVAC type or HVAC kind is of DGS. Thing? Okay. Um, Paint, carpet, uh, refrigerators, appliances, that's all cabinets. That's all. Us. That's all you guys. Yeah. I mean, what I've noticed, and, and to your point, I think you brought. <laughs> I'm glad uh, kept the chair mentioned this. You're saying two thousand eight dollars, not even inflation adjusted. You're saying actual dollars. Like, just I just want to underscore how bad that is. You know, we have as chair of the education committee, we often talk about per pupil funding, inflation adjusted dollars, which is still that's a huge that's still a big gap. But you're talking about actual dollars. So the amount, how far behind we are, is just amazing. And we've added I don't know how many we've added since '08, but a dozen. I don't know. You know, but you know, a, a, yeah. yeah. I, w I would also add that. Um, the last 10 years or so, we've also had to redirect some of our peeler money to cover security equipment. Um, you know, adding new cameras, right. outdoor cameras, right. um, updating them, um, which is eating our peeler as well. Right, things that you didn't even maybe use yeah. back back at that time when Correct. you had that number. So just uh, just underscoring that. So it's woefully underfunded. And you know, we we've had an increased usage and an increased need coming out of the pandemic, and then free in 23. I've certainly seen. Uh, I, I was with, I was at Long Branch recently for a community meeting, and it was like that. Talk about my hometown rec center. I'm talking about going from morning till night, and and just being pushed to the max. And like you said, East County, Potomac, all of them are getting used. Um, so the hunt, I just want to understand the number. It says in the packet 115,000 in two tranches. Is that where? What is that something? My miss. Where's the 49 number? So in, in the original packet. Um, is this the addendum? It, the addendum okay. reduces the amount. So the toll that council staff had recommended in the original package was 115,000 and splitting it. And that would bring it up to the okay. fiscal year 08 funding amount. Um, since that time, uh, additional information came over and it suggested that the actual budget for PILAR was a little bit higher. And as a result, to bring it up to the fiscal year 08 you level, need as much. you wouldn't need as much. You'd okay. need about 49000 or 50000 Understanding that the 08 level in raw dollars is dramatically it, below what's required. Absolutely. But, but obviously we're, okay, so I was, that's where the number came from. You, were just, you just had the goal of how do we at least at get least it we to we don't where, have to say, you know, it. it's below. Okay. Got it, got it, understood <laughs> but, that. But of course, again, I mean, and it's a tight budget year, but again, um, they could use much more than that to bring things up, you know, up. But again, there's there's a lot of you know weighing of different items in the overall budget. I, absolutely, yeah. And, and but I think you know, so so the list would be helpful too of how you would prioritize. Um, and and yes, this number is a number on a piece of paper. But just I just think put what, from my view, like what what the needs actually are. I, and I think that will demonstrate, you know, we're, we're not going to meet them, obviously, in this budget, but can we put ourselves on a path to, to meeting them, you know? No, I appreciate you saying that. Let's at least get the what the inflation-adjusted number would be. Yes. The, the needs are probably limitless, yeah. so I think that would yeah. be hard for yeah, the department to do, but at least say this is not inflation-adjusted. An easy number to get is what, what would the inflation number, if we were to make the yeah, department we whole for yeah. where we were in 2008 inflation-adjusted, what would that look like? I think that at least would tell the story of the gap of how far away the department has been asked to 
work through, you know, yeah. uh, the intervening years. It, and how you would use that money, right? You know, uh, how you would prioritize the usage of any increase. And, and sure. I think we talked yep. about that. We can, but, we can get that back to you for sure. Yeah, and I, and I really appreciate what you're doing because it's, it's a big need, and these are ground zero for our residents. Like you said, we had one, I'll never forget, I'll lift up the testimony of one of our seniors who had, who had testified she said she was doing the Tai Chi at the Potomac Community Center, I think it was, mm -hmm. and that it was a hun there were 150 people in the, like, uh, over 100 people in the class, and it, like, and it fills up in like 15 minutes. It's, and these are seniors navigating an it, online yeah, system. It's, right. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Springsteen ticket, yes, for sure, yeah. with a wait list, huge right. wait list. Right, so, and I know like, I signed my little guy up for swimming, like you can't, no. No. don't even try. Like, you know, unless you're on there with a fast gigabyte internet connection right when it goes on. So uh, just underscoring that this is important to our community. So thank you and yield back. Thank you for that. And I'm glad you, you lifted that up. And it is true for many of these signups from, again, the youngest to the oldest. They are, you know, a spring scene or a Taylor Swift ticket, and it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be. But some of that is also staffing, and some of that is also the use of the facilities. You know, if we can't get the PLAR dollars to make all of our facilities as operational and useful as they can be, we're missing the opportunity to reach people who, who need it. Councilor Funny Gonzalez. I agree with the staff recommendation, and, and I echo everything that it has been said. Just one of the things. Great. Okay, so we have a couple follow-up items at the very least to make the case for why this very modest suggestion is being put forward. I think we're going to start with the council staff recommendation at 49524 but I do think for contact at the very least, it would be helpful uh, to have the uh, inflation adjusted and, and for full council, I think that would be helpful when we present this so we can say here's what we're proposing based on the council staff recommendation in the context here's what the inflation adjusted number would, would be, so colleagues are aware of that. I think that would not only help make the case for this budget, but also for preparing ahead for future years uh, to make the case with both the executive and the council that you know, PLAR is not the sexiest of budget items because it doesn't have a particular community and a constituency, uh, but it is critical to the people who are actually relying on these facilities every day. So uh, with that, we'll accept the council staff recommendation and let's continue. Okay, so um, we're moving on to recreation vacancies. As of April 5th, the department is carrying 11 vacancies, which is shown on the table on page 8 of your packet. All but one of these vacancies are have been vacant for less than one year. An updated organization chart for the department is attached at circle 16 of your packet. The executive is recommending, uh, the executive's budget assumes 554000 $568 in unspent personnel costs for fiscal year 25, and it's a reduction of approximately 45000 to the budgeted amount for fiscal year 24. Um, one new position is recommended for fiscal year 25, and the table on pa in the middle of page 8 of your packet shows the historic unspent personnel costs and vacancies. Um, Council staff recommends approval of the CE's proposed assumption for unspent personnel costs. The department doesn't have as many uh, positions, uh, new positions to fill, and they have been more moving forward aggressively to recruit and fill positions. Councilor Drawn. This is something I, probably longer conversation, you can get back to me, but again, testimony that, and I thought about this before, but I heard it, I forget who, who said it, that how many of your positions are seasonal and how that churn of bringing people on seasonally when these are jobs that, you know, and when you need them and how that, how that impacts service delivery and the ability to get good people in and to have the consistency. That's something I think we just need to talk about, out, you know, probably outside of the budget context, but I just want to flag it because when I, I, I know it's a large, you all have probably have the largest number of part-time folks. 2,800. 2,800, yeah. Out of how many? Uh, uh, we have 181 career employees. 181 career, and then 2,800 are seasonal. So we, I just think, I know we've talked about this before, but I just want to put a marker down to between this year and next year to really see if, if, if that's the best service delivery model for, for our residents. And just for context, 
Um, a lot of the reductions to uh, uh, career staff in that, you know, in, in the centers, I think a lot of that occurred during the, the recession. Right. So it was like, how can, you know, how can you save? How can you reduce? And so I think there was a lot of reduction to career staff and then filling in with seasonal staff. I think that was Alan Cohen who mentioned that during the uh, operating budget uh, pu public hearings who, you know, along with a small group of others, is actually responsible for there even being a Potomac Community Center, uh, you know, over 35 years ago, an elementary school site, and the question was, what are we going to do with this site? And now it's one of the most heavily utilized facilities in all of county government, and it could have been something not used for public benefit, uh, you know, for, you know, or, or used for an entirely different uh, use. So it, it speaks to that. But it's an important, it's an important issue and something that, you know, we ought to get a handle on and address. Recreation, perhaps more than any other department, took a disproportionate share of the impact in response to the Great Recession, and nobody knows that better than Gabe Albernaz, our colleague, uh, who was leading the charge and, and, and having to address the, uh, the dynamics within the department after that edict came through. Um, but it was at least at first thought of, you know, weathering the storm, uh, but, you know, it carried on to the next storm and then the next storm af after that. And I think uh, to Councilmember Jawanda's point, you know, we are going to have to grapple with whether or not those decisions continue to make the most sense and whether or not, um, you know, it, it is, uh, you know, a reasonable way to address it. I mean, the, the constant churn of seasonal employees also takes a toll on the organization in terms of just onboarding and recruiting and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging environment. Having said that, seasonal employees are always going to be a critical part of how a Department of Recreation functions. It's, it's a department based on seasons yeah. in, in, in many respects. The, the sports activities and yep. you know, recreation programs in many ways are, are seasonal, and so uh, some of that is unavoidable, but the question is what's the right mix and the right yeah. balance? I agree, and um, training and onboarding them is, is one hurdle. The other is, um, getting young people to come to work is, is a real challenge mm -hmm. right now. And when you're hiring um, 15 and 16 year olds that are mandated by state law to only work four hours, um, and you've got to open a pool at five, and you got to close a pool at 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night, and you need lifeguards, it is tough. It is very, very tough. Yeah, so lots lots of things to think through, and you know we're not going to solve the problems today or as part of this budget, but uh, this committee looks forward to working collaboratively with you and the department to figure out how to address these issues and come up with what the right mix would be and to advocate collectively for that. With that, let's, let's continue. Okay, so there's a couple of programming enhancements that are recommended for seniors. The first one is just enhanced funding for senior programming at an amount of $100,891. This recommended funding would support 15 additional hours of instructor-led classes, programs, or events at neighborhood senior programs. Um, the funding would support an e increase in evening and weekend programming to meet the recreational needs of 50, the 55 plus community. Um, council st staff re recommends adding this item to the new enhanced programs list. Yes. Without objection, we will add that to the new and enhanced programs list. And the next one is my favorite um, title for a new program. It's the Senior Barbecue Bonanza Engagement Event for an increase of $72,213. This is a community event that is intended to strengthen social ties of older adults across the county. It's to serve as a platform for socialization across cultures, mental stimulation support, and health promotion. And it's anticipated to take place at the Gaithersburg Fairgrounds and serve over 450 seniors. Council staff recommends adding this item on the new enhanced programs list. Yeah, my only objection is it's the Montgomery County Fairgrounds in the city of Gaithersburg. <laughs> the fairgrounds belong to all of us, but um, I think that it, it's 
one of the most important functions that the Department of Recreation is responsible for is programming for our older adult population. Our older adults need it more than ever. Uh, the challenges are bigger than ever. We have, it's the fastest growing population in Montgomery County, by far 9,000 new 65 and older residents uh, added to, to, to the roles uh, each, each and every year. And the, the challenges for health and wellness, for mental health, for social isolation uh, uh, issues uh, are, are massive. So um, a small program uh, to meet a huge need, but something that um, I think is uh, really important and part of a much broader array of activities that the department does. Uh, with that, uh, without objection, we will uh, add that to the new and enhanced programs list. Of course, has to compete against other items, but uh, will be up for discussion at the full council. With that name, though, it's gonna, it has a good shot. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, the bonanza really sets it over the top. Um, the next item is inflationary adjustments to eligible nonprofit contracts for a total of $99,606. Uh, these are the 3% inflationary adjustments that we're seeing in many departments across county government. Um, the recommended percentage increase for 25 is consistent with the percentage increase for 24 and reflects the general assumption of 12-month inflation used in the fiscal year 25 recommended budget. A list of nonprofit service contracts is provided in the attachments. Um, certainly, the council received testimony from some nonprofit providers that requested an increase, uh, another 3% over the executive's recommendation. Um, council staff recommends adding this amount to the new and enhanced programs list. Yeah, and just to note, we're going to take up the nonprofit uh, across the board, right. across all uh, nonprofits to treat everybody you know, equitably and, 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 and fairly here. Um, so we're not going to formally make a recommendation as part of the committee. We'll take it up uh, as part of the uh, you know, full council because we have a lot of nonprofits and you know, many departments and um, having different recommendations on different items. Um, you know, you know, ultimately, this decision has to be made by the full council anyway. So. Okay. The next item is an increased uh, $126,977 in grant funding. Um, it's you, the funding is used um, to reimburse recreation for seasonal staff costs um, to support and manage the congregate meal program. Um, the increase will provide for an increase of 3.68 FTEs for seasonal employees, and these employees have been tasked with a larger scope of duties for these congregate meals. Um, also, the department reports it's seeing a, quite an influx of seniors participating in programming across their facilities, um, and the department has been expanding senior meals to various uh, facilities that qualify with the appropriate number of seniors asking for, for the service. So council staff recommends approval of this increase. Sounds good. Without objection, we will agree. Okay. There's two operating budget amendments that came over after March 15th. The first one is $74,472 for rental space for um, at the Baker Middle School from June to August uh, to support program programming that was taking place at Damascus uh, Senior Center. So the program will be five days per week from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. and also the purchase of a shed to store equipment. And this funding is needed while the current center is closed for its refresh. Council staff recommends approving this as submitted. Okay, without objection. Okay, and the last uh, operating budget uh, am amendment is the purchase of EPAC software and equipment for $145,100. This is a one-time purchase of this software um, and equipment to support legally required customer intake, health records, data collection, and management. Um, the software and equipment will address data security and accessibility for youth camps and trips and support the health and safety of youth participating in recreation programs. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question. We, we talked about this last year and just 
we get an update on where things it wasn't funded yeah so it wasn't so I just, that's what i thought so it wasn't funded last year so now you're going to implement it this year with this funding hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> it's approved i mean that's the that's yeah your intention. i mean it's a, it, it's really you know with hipaa standards and we're finding more and more young people that are having medical issues during our summer camp and when they travel ha having a piece of paper in a medical box trying to track it down and keep it secure make sure that our camp staff have it with us where, where it can be on a phone where we can give access to the camp director and the nurse and then turn it off at the end of the season and then the parent only fills it out one time not for multiple camps and across seasons happy to support it without objection the committee supports including this terrific and so we just have some follow-up on the recommended CIP um, the starting on page nine of your packet um, there's just a summary of what the fed committee talked about when it reviewed the department's cip it recommended approval of five projects um, silver spring recreation and aquatic center the recreation facilities asset replacement project the recreation facilities playground replacement swimming pool slide replacement and wall park garage and park improvements um, it recommended the three refurbishment projects with uh, additional language that just provided provides for providing notice to the council and it requested additional information before making a recommendation for the Mar Martin Luther King Jr. Indoor Swim Center the Kenny Shriver Aquatic Center building envelope improvement and then Holiday Park net zero um, um, and also the co council members requested that the executive confirm plans regarding whether they were integrating a recreation facility at the KSAC. Um, so with Kennedy Shriver, uh, there was a request to understand the schedule for uh, construction among the indoor swim facilities. Um, and the the KSAC is tentatively planning, um, the department's tentatively planning to take KSAC offline in fiscal year 25. Um, there is a schedule for planned staging of refurbishment projects that's included in your packet circles 43 to 44, and it shows construction on KSAC beginning in the summer of 24, 2024, and then continuing for a year, during which time the next indoor pool in the queue which is presumably Martin Luther King will be in the design phase um, and then it has after the first year then the next one going into construction um, that however is not necessarily consistent with the refer with the KSAC building envelope expenditure schedule which shows construction in both 25 and 26 um, so council staff you know um, the committee may want to understand um, how you know whether or, or at least request that um, the PDFs be updated based on what a realistic schedule for construction would be could you respond to that do we want to why don't we welcome <laughs> up DGS director dice Her expression was asking for you, so I obliged. Hi, David Dice, Director, Department of General Services. Joining me as Deputy Director for Capital Projects, Greg Austin. Uh, so everything that we do with the Department of Recreation, uh, particularly with their indoor pools and outdoor pools, is, is coordinated based upon their needs and requirements. So. With the limited number of indoor pools, we only close one at a time. We don't close two outdoor pools the same way. And then the pressures on my staff and contractors to make sure that we hustle as much as we can to meet what is a relatively narrow window because we're not going to close it for two seasons. We've got one shutdown season to do the work and one alone. So I say that to say this. The work at MLK indoor pool is done. There is some long-term work that we'll schedule at a later date, but at no point would a major indoor pool like uh, MLK be shut down while another major indoor pool is also shut down. KSAC, or the Kennedy Shriver 
uh, aquatic center. I have Sydney Katz rolling in the back of my head to stop using acronyms. So the Kennedy Shriver Aquatic Center is uh, is in very very poor shape. Uh, the 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 walls, the frame, everything about that building is in desperate need of work. We've been postponing it until the Silver Spring Aquatic Center was online. That's now online, and that's why we're moving forward with uh, to begin work at KSAC this fall. And that, uh, I think it's July. Or July, right. Right, excuse me, as soon as the, uh, as soon as the uh, season's over, so that we can get in there and do that work. And uh, I'm assured by my team that it's one year's worth of work, and then it'll be back online. So uh, I, I wonder, but that's the schedule that we've worked out with recreation. Robin, you want to clarify? Yeah. Okay. We've been told longer, two, two years. Two years? Mm -hmm. is, that, is that right about? Yeah, I've got to look at the schedule. I'll have to look at the schedule. I, I, I know it's not two years, but well, that's good. anyway. The uh, the work there will begin. The work on the at MLK is in the outdoor pool, and that is uh, work that has not been done at all. It's principally uh, a major deck replacement around the outside pool. You'll see in the staff package the responses from the executive branch reference the the pool deck, the showers, the lazy river waiting lagoon, and and others. Those are all at the outdoor pool. There is some minor work for ADA that needs to be done in the indoor pool, but uh, that would not impact negatively the operation of the pool. It could function while that work is being done. So uh, there is some deck replacement that will have to be done on MLK indoor pool in the future, but that, again, that work will be coordinated with uh, the Department of Recreation. So based on schedule. what you shared, is the PDF as we currently have it before us accurate based on the timeline? Uh, as far as I mean, the, that's the main issue that the council good. staff has raised. And yeah, good afternoon, Greg Austin, um, DGS. Yeah, the the PDF is 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 accurate and fine. I think it it's important to note that the in terms of shutting the facility down to the public for use, and not necessarily that schedule syncing up with the expenditure schedule. After construction is done or majority is complete and we're able to open the facility back up for use, doesn't mean that we stop uh, spending money and don't have invoices that need to be paid and that bleed into the following year. So the construction, the physical construction project may not sync up with an expenditure schedule because we have a year's worth of warranty, we have uh, other uh, work that, that is getting completed after the construction is done. Um, so that often bleeds into the following fiscal year. That's what you're seeing yeah. here. So in response to the council staff's concern, Department of General Services is confident that the expenditure schedule as reflected in the PDF That's correct. is accurate. Yes, yep. absolutely. Okay. I see. Uh, why don't we turn it to council staff if, there, if, if that response is uh, sufficient from your perspective. Um, you know, I defer to OMB and DGS, but, you know, if, if, if you start closing down the facility in the summer, it's the beginning of 25, and it goes for the year. It's basically through 25, and the large amount of expenditures are showing in 26 through 28. So it just, it, it, it seems a little odd to me. It would be reasonable that the major amount of expenditures on a capital project will fall towards the latter part of that project. So it would probably be into the early parts of FY26 uh, as, to, as opposed to the uh, everything falling within one fiscal year. This project is going to straddle the fiscal years and the final payments uh, and, uh, and, and uh, warranty work that Mr. Assant mentioned will carry over for at least another year to a year and a half afterwards. Now, I'm not, I can't speak to how it's spread out for, for affordability, but this is the, the way the project works in a 12 to 18 month project. Uh, a, a great deal of the expenditures are happening in the middle to end. That's why we estimate project budgets to the middle of the project, because we know that's where the bulk of the expenses will occur. Okay, Councilor Juwan. Thank you. Um, 
appreciate it. And yeah, and we, I'm just we came back to this because it was a little fuzzy when we first went over it. It, it got a little fuzzy at the beginning here, where, where the director of recreation said she was told it's going to be shut down for two years, uh, and you said no, it's not going to be two years. So, which is great. I'm saying the work won't take two years. It might actually be two years of, a, of your season, though. Uh, but it's about it's about 12 to 18 months, is what I'm being told by staff. We're talking case Kennedy Shriver. Right. Kennedy Shriver. Okay. I mean, we were told we were out for two years. It might be. Could you just say that on? Yeah, the, exactly. Yeah. Okay. The director Riley is saying she was told that the the facility would be out for two years. If the project takes eighteen months to construct, it will overlap into one of their seasons, which would be effectively two seasons for recreation. We're talking sort of apples and oranges here. I'm talking months to construct. They're talking operational seasons. So it may be two seasons for recreation. It's about 12 to 18 months okay. for the construction. Director Riley, what, what, uh, what, we don't, could you sorry, move the mic pool, down to you, too? Can you move the mic towards your mouth? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. Indoor, our indoor pools don't technically have seasons. We're open year Yeah, round. this is an indoor pool, pool. <laughs> so it's not I mean, an outdoor our pool. peak season, if that's winter, right. that's what you mean. I just, I just would love, I, I get frustrated when there's like not an exact answer and we, we, we continued this so we could get more clear about it because there's only 11 pools in the county and people care about them a lot and and so I just and then we now we have added on in addition to the lack of clarity of how long it's going to be closed we've added on when the money needs to be spent and we know there's a ton of pressure in the first two years of the CIP you know for money in, in all the CIP um, so I just uh, I, w I would like to be a little more clear on the expenditure schedule, and if it's going to take two, you know, two years for the indoor, you know, just I just I think we just need to understand that a little bit more. I'd be happy to provide you the construction schedule once we have it from the contractor. Contractor has okay. been contract has been awarded, and the contractor is ordering materials and will begin work as soon, this summer as soon as we close it down. We'll have a construction schedule that I'd be happy to provide the council. And so we can just be clear with the public too, right? Absolutely. And, and, and if there's, for example, the the, the set you have seventeen, you have two two and a half million and twenty five, seventeen million and twenty six, and nine million and twenty seven. Uh, is that you know i'm assuming that there was something that went into that right you know that, that that's why you sent it over if there's any potential change based on the construction schedule it will be nice to align to council staff's point just align these up a little bit that could help us with what we're doing i know your your main concern is not the affordability of of across the years but that's what we're trying to balance. No, my main concern would, of course, be paying the contractor. Of course, what he's, what as he's it should do. be. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and based upon their schedule uh, to have the funds there, I'm not exactly sure the calculation that goes into the affordability and spreading that money out on a chart. But I know that when the when the pay request has to come in, we pay them, and. Uh, the 18 months uh, would uh, then be followed, but probably about three months worth of punch list work and testing and commissioning. So uh, the, all that money is spread out, but it's not over three and a half years. I can t I can tell you that. Okay. So yeah, just, this chair, I just think we just need some clarity there. But yeah, agreed. I, you know, I think I, I wholeheartedly agree. We're we're back uh, kind of to where we started here. We, we do need some more clarity, and we do need some better communication and coordination between departments and with the council staff and executive staff so that all of us can prepare and that we can commu communicate with, with the public. So if we can get that solidified, I understand we're not going to know to the week of what the construction schedule is until you have the contract in hand, but I would imagine today we have an idea of how long we expect this to take, around when we expect it to start, and we can plan from there um, and make sure that we're all on the same page. It, it sounds like the, you know one department was not told you know about the, the the timeline. Maybe we are talking about different things, but we need to know what we're talking about. So we need to make sure that we're all on the same page. So I, I think there's work to be done there, and it does have an impact on the decisions that we make here and other decisions that we're going to have to make here. So, um, okay. 
Okay, so then are we going to come? Yeah, what what is our plan here on that? Are we going to come back to this? Or are you going to? Um, I mean, the other option. I mean, you we are going to approve this unless there are any objections. So perhaps we can ask for this in the council packet for the full council yeah. packet before the council to say that we discuss it and the responses to our answer. So we don't have to hold this up per se because we're approved you know we're supportive of it and have said we're supportive yeah. uh, of it these projects we want to see happen but we want to make sure that they're reflected accurately in the CIP and that everybody understands the the timeline yeah. so yep. okay so that yeah. reflects the committee's will we're going to support this but we want to see additional information to be provided for the council packet from the departments and we would like both DGS and recreation to be and OMB is sitting in the back, uh, you know, to be aware and engaged and agree uh, on you know what the assumptions are. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, the, the next item was the Martin Luther King Indoor Swim Center. Uh, Director Dice uh, mentioned that they provided a very detailed explanation of of the cost increase that we didn't have before. So that's on page twelve of your packet. Um, and again, there was discussion just now about the schedule, but otherwise, council staff recommends approval of, of this project. Um, no objection. Thank you for providing that. Um, the next item is the Holiday Park Next Zero initiative. Again, the, the committee requested additional information about the cost increase, as well as the extent to which the building would be closed for programming for the net zero ADA remedi remediation and then the refurbishment project. Um, the cost increase, uh, executive staff said that the cost increase reflects revised cost estimates and market escalation as well as um, the inclusion of a million dollars that was previously planned to be funded by the building envelope repair project. And so um, they do indicate that the PEF's fiscal note should indicate this updated amount uh, uh, in the PDF. Um, so again, council staff recommends approval of this project with an updated fiscal note and language that is consistent with the, you know, the schedule is consistent with the other projects. Uh, in the recreation facility refurbishment project. As a point of clarity, I want to emphasize this is for the net zero uh, improvements to the facility. It is not the refurbishment. The refurbishment is being re-looked re at. The uh, initial estimates that came in are quite high and are concerning to me. So uh, we, we want to include this in with the other work that we're going to be doing under the umbrella of rec center refurbishments and and uh, my strategy is to go in and do a detailed analysis of the top five projects. Uh, Director Riley just sent me an email recently outlining what those are. We want to go and do a detailed assessment of those to see what the impact is so that we can come back to you with an honest accounting for what we think a refurbishment initiative over the next 10 to 15 years is actually going to cost because I can't tell you that right now. Uh, but well, we hopefully it's not an 82.7% increase on that project as well. Qu question for you on, on, on this. Can the net zero project move forward? I know, the I was the idea was to do it in conjunction, the ADA project, the refurbishment project, and the net zero project. Is the net zero project something that you have to you know, rip the walls out and you know, do the changes that you were otherwise planning to do for a refurbishment, or is that something that could be a I was just about to explain. The Net Please. Zero project is principally an envelope improvement, uh, which means uh, fixing doors, windows, walls, roofs, uh, to make the, the building uh, airtight uh, so that we can control the atmosphere and manage the, the, those things uh, more accurately uh, and create the building to be more efficient. So that work can be done while the facility is being used. It will involve, it will involve phasing the work and moving what was one activity in one room 
this this quarter will now be on the other side of the building in the next quarter so that we're closing can rooms not shut facility. down parts of the building to because yeah. we'll have to pull out windows and put new windows right. in and things so like it's really that. a weatherization project it, essentially yeah you could consider it that yes it's it's and you know uh, an airtight structure is a more efficient structure uh, but we will be uh, uh, coordinating. We had a, a meeting with Recreation last week to introduce this concept. Uh, I know the concern has been with the seniors being bused to other locations. We think that the work can be coordinated. It will be internally inconvenient insofar as the building's concerned, but no one we, we expect will have to go anywhere. It will require relocating some program staff in the building to other locations, but the programs themselves, we don't anticipate having to leave the site. Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez. Please give me poster. I'm getting all these phone calls from, from the senior community going to the center. And I need something very detailed with the schedule, what activities are not going to be happening. Um, and also, um, if certain things are not going to happen at the Holiday Center, let's say they're happening in another center, uh, is there going to be a shuttle service? What's the coordination with DOT um, to take care of that? So. Well, again, we just spoke with uh, recreation staff, Director Riley and some of her team last week about this. As a, as a concept, we believe it's workable. Again, it, it's not that it's smooth. It will require some, um, some dancing around the floor plan, but we, we're confident that we can do that work without having to close the building down. I look forward to getting more detailed information on the schedule so we can all be in sync. Thank you. Okay, thanks. That clarifies it. Thank you for uh, clarifying that. And I think the reassurance, Director Dice, that um, the facility itself is not going to close as part of that project, but rooms will be closed or parts of the facility for temporary periods of time while actual work is being done on that part of, of the building, I think will be important for folks to know. And I'm sure uh, Councilman Fani Gonzalez and all of us, because this is not just a single district facility. I mean, this is a facility that serves a lot of our older adult population countywide. So uh, obviously, you know how important it is to a lot of residents. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we've heard that from obviously council and recreation as well. So that's why we've given this project a second look. And I spoke about this during the school's CIP. I, I was in high school during a construction project. So I can attest to it being disruptive. But, uh, you know, we also hear from people who don't want to be bused to other facilities or be inconvenienced because you know the facility that they have relied on is not the place where they go. And so there always is a balance to that. And so we understand that there are probably going to be some impacts, not to say that it, it can be done without impact, but uh, I think most who we have heard from, and I'm sure who uh, Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez has, has heard from, um, will be reassured that the facility will not be closed, you know, in total. I think that's helpful. Okay, any other? There's just one on item, this? which yeah, is okay. the, the North Bethesda project. Yeah. Um, again, this project comes to the county with in the beyond six year category, but the description of the project says that it will be developed in association with the development of the Kennedy Shriver Aquatic Center in Wall Park. And the estimated schedule is dependent upon implementation of the White Flint sector plan and affordability considerations. So this was a discussion at the March 4th CIP review. Um, again, uh, council members, I think we're interested in hearing the executive's plans regarding integrating the recreation center at the KSEC facility. And I guess, you know, before approving this PDF, um, just would want to confirm if that continues to be the executive's plan or whether that has changed and then we would need to change the language in the PDF. I'm going to refer to re defer to the director of the Department of Recreation. You know, we'll build what we're told to build. Uh, and uh, if North Bethesda Community Recreation Center is in the CIP but not in the present, it's in the out years. Uh, but I'm going to defer to recreations to what its intentions are. Yeah. After much discussion, yes, it'll stay as a PDF, stay in the plans. It's still a ways out, but we'll keep it here for sure. Okay. Appre appreciate that. So 
Uh, it will stay in. Please keep us posted on ongoing plans and conversations. And if things change, we'd like to know about it. And I think the community certainly would like to be uh, informed about it. I'll just note two others. Uh, Bethesda Recreation Center, which we'll all follow up and you know is an ongoing conversation. So just wanted to, to note that. Uh, it came up last time and just wanted to uh, make sure that I, I noted that there still is a significant need and by far the fastest growing uh, uh, you know, part of the county in terms of new housing units uh, and the oldest part when we talk about recreation centers serving our older adult populations uh, you know we need to make sure that we you know we're serving those needs uh, and uh, similarly to just want to lift up uh, Montgomery Village we've heard a lot of uh, testimony and a lot of support and a lot of interest uh, in uh, Montgomery Village. It's a community uh, with significant need as well, and there are opportunities for partnership in both of these. Uh, and I know that uh, recreation is not capable of uh, delivering on these on their own, uh, but you know, my hope and, and uh, interest uh, is in seeing what partnerships that we can do in order to leverage county resources and leverage county uh, assets uh, with other outside partners to serve community needs. Yeah, I, I agree. And based on your previous conversation with HOC in terms of programming at partnerships too, I um, mean, we have a great partnership with HOC at, at the new building, Silver Spring. Um, we just um, are able to support HOC with a summer camp program at Cider Mill. And we worked with um, Club 480 to transport um, about 15 youth to a soccer program this weekend also. So lifts all boats. Terrific. Sure. And I think that's the model. And I think that's going to help us to address some of these dynamics, notwithstanding uh, it makes some of these projects a lot more complicated that I think DGS can uh, attest to and, and uh, HOC and others can attest to uh, the more involved to the, the more challenge, but also the more opportunity. So uh, finding the right balance on that is important. Uh, Council Member Jawanda. Thanks. I appreciate that and glad that transportation issue that we were all cop glad that. Thank you for doing that. Um, we're going to have to come back to the trans as we talked about. The transportation is a huge issue for so many of our kids and seniors. Um, the s schedule on the recreation res refurbishment you talked about this director dice it, it the way on on the pdf not the pdf excuse me on the circle uh the chart here it says kind of like you know it has wheaton Kasak, damascus holiday park and then it just goes to like general indoor outdoor rec indoor outdoor rec do you have a more guidance on because i can think of we have these 11 pools i'm thinking of only right now just of, like i asked that question earlier of that that multi-purpose room that is just in need of some TLC, it's not a doesn't need to be torn down. But like you know, where where what's the schedule of when, where the uh, rest of these folks fall, and how are you determining that? Are you talking about it's all new swim center? Yeah, I'm yes. sorry. So yeah. that's different, and that's yeah. the other question: swim centers versus recs. Uh, as Director Dice identified, we can't close multiple pools at the same time. Sure. It's just chaotic. So um, the order of priority priority is um, Kennedy Shriver then over to Martin Luther King to fix some of the few things that are still there um, Alney has some ADA work that still has to happen um, so they'll be in that order kind of okay. in the priority order and then what about the stuff that's not the pool right like because you could fix the multi-purpose or the weights or you know or, or other things without shutting the pool down don't have the financial resources it's to just do that. it's just a matter of we just got to tough it out. It's a combination of factors, actually. It's certainly money looms large. Uh, the other side of the coin is when you have to shut down facilities to do one part and then turn it, open it back up, and then shut it again a, a year and a half or two years later, it tries people's patience. Our, what we try to do is shut it down once, do everything, and get the heck out, and everyone can enjoy it for another. 10 or 15 years. Uh, Only has actually been on our books for a few years now. The problem, particular problem with Only uh, Swim Center portion is that the, the decks in, in bad shape. Uh, worse is the, the, the piping underneath the deck, the heating and cooling elements to that. Are, the pipes are shot. 
So it, that's going to only pool is going to be a tremendous amount of work. Uh, so as a result, we've moved to other projects. Uh, that there are some dramatic components of other other spaces within that facility that need work. Uh, we can try and work something out with recreation. I'm not sure the nature of the problems and the extent that they would go to repair, right. but um, I mean, it's, it's something like we can look. work with REC. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and it's good we to know. We got PILAR. Right. right. Well, we're, try <laughs> we're trying. That's, what, that's where I was going there, you know, PILAR, yeah. So, I mean, we're trying to generally move more money into that across the board, the schools, you all are trying to be more responsible in that way. So, well, Council Member Juwando, if I, I've said this before, I'll, I'll say it again. We could, we could cut new facilities in half, and I could still spend all the leftover money just fixing what's around. Yeah, there's a lot of that. There's to always be done. that, always yeah. that need. All right. Well, I appreciate it, and thank you for that update. At least for the interim schedule, that's helpful. So, KSAC, MLK, only in that order. That's at least that. That's enough to on my plate, on our plate right now. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Okay, and the last item is um, uh, the skills for the future NDA, um, and that's packet number three for the committee. Thank um, you to DGS for joining us. We'll uh, relieve you of your duties here, uh, understanding there are a lot of building needs, as you just noted, a never-ending punch list. Uh, with that, let's turn it back to council staff. I'll note that uh, Carl Lesser from Kid Museum is here. Mm -hmm. Uh, main recipient of the Skills for the Future funds. Ms. Yao? Okay, so the Skills for the Future NDA provides for high quality STEAM programming in both academic and recreation settings for low income youth. For fiscal year 25, the executives recommending an $8,294 increase for a total budget of $293,317 for the NDA. Um, that's a 3% increase, and as the council president noted earlier, the 3% increase for you know a nonprofit service providers is going to be taken up by the council. Um, council. Staff notes that the Kid Museum is the only recipient of funds for recommended for the Skills for the Future NDA, and uh, Kid Museum also receives funding in the department's base budget as well as um, its own NDA. And I believe that there's uh, the executive is recommending uh, an additional increase in his budget amendments for Kid Museum. Um, Council staff again. Uh, recommends a treating the 3% as we are, we are with the other inflationary adjustments recommended by the executive. Thank you. So as we discussed, uh, you know, without objection, we'll approve the uh, main skills for the future funding. The enhanced funding will go on the, uh, you know, will be addressed by the full council as part of what we do for all nonprofits since this was identified in the county executive's budget as, uh, you know, inflationary increase for nonprofit providers, so we'll just treat it as we do with uh, all of the other ones, but the base budget from last year we will uh, approve uh, enthusiastically. I did want to note, uh, it's in the packet, I just wanted to lift it up here, um, that, uh, and it's highlighted in circles two and three, I appreciate council staff for, uh, for uplifting this as well. Uh, the Kid Museum reported that 72% of the 3,762 students participating in the inventions programs were from Title I or high farms rates schools, and 8 in 10 participants identified as students of color or multiracial. And the program provided access to summer camps by awarding scholarships to 42% of the 684 students enrolled. In a nutshell, just talking about how important this program is to create skills and to inspire young people, particularly some of our at-risk students and those who you know, historically and disproportionately have fewer opportunities to access after-school programs, particularly of this uh, quality uh, and uh, uh, you know, in, in the STEAM area you know, specifically. So just wanted to note that it's uh, been really important and did want to highlight uh, this was uh, a prior initiative that the previous iteration of this council fought very, or this committee, excuse me, fought very hard to include these funds several years ago uh, with then Chair Reamer and I working with Council Member Juwando, the three of us advanced 
skills for the future, you know, created this concept, moved it forward, pushed for it to be funded, uh, and ultimately uh, the benefit and you know, who it is benefiting and the targeted intentional uh, efforts speak for themselves. So uh, kudos uh, to the department, kudos to our partner in the Kid Museum, uh, and just wanted to acknowledge uh, former Chair Reamer and uh, Councilmember Juwando and you know our collective work and Councilmember Fani Gonzalez for continuing that commitment uh, as part of this committee because it didn't happen by accident. We had to make a real intentional effort to fund this program and it has really worked out well. And I did want to note that um, many of the other programs that the Kid Museum uh, uh, is involved in will be taken up by the Education and Culture Committee uh, under the leadership of uh, Councilmember Jawando, and so he is playing dual roles uh, here uh, as well. So uh, this is one piece of several other pieces, uh, but uh, ultimately uh, all for the same important purpose of providing STEAM opportunities and to inspire a new generation of young people and one that is reflective of our county. With that, we will approve as indicated and uh, we'll take up the inflationary increases as part of the broader context with the full council. I wanna thank the Department of Recreation for all of your work. Thank you to Ms. Yao for your efforts and your thoughtfulness in moving this forward. And with that, colleagues, we are adjourned. How are you doing? Oh, okay.